Welcome once again to Meet the Press. Our program today comes to you from Los Angeles, California, and our guests are two of the youngest governors of the country, Governor Mark Hatfield, Republican of Oregon, 37, and Governor J. Howard Edmondson, Democrat of Oklahoma, 34. Governors Hatfield and Edmondson have attracted attention far beyond the borders of their states because they are representative of the new political generation which is gaining power in both parties. We're going to divide our time equally between them. First, Governor Hatfield. Governor Hatfield is one of the few Republicans who successfully bucked the Democratic tide last year. His remarkable victory and the position of Oregon as the testing ground for presidential candidates have won him a national spotlight. Before he was elected governor, he was a professor of political science and a dean at Willamette University. He served in both houses of the state legislature and as Oregon Secretary of State. And now seated around the press table, ready to question our guests, are Gladwin Hill of the New York Times, Bill Henry of NBC News, J. Edward Murray of the Los Angeles Mirror News, and Jack Bell of the Associated Press. And now we'll start the questioning with Jack Bell. Governor, you've earned the reputation as a liberal Republican. And as one of the few Republican governors elected in 1958, I assume that you feel that you have a responsibility of leadership along that line. In 1955, you made a speech in which you suggested that Vice President Nixon should be taken off the ticket in favor of a liberal, suggesting Paul Hoffman. After the election last year, you're quoted as saying that you assumed that uh, Governor Rockefeller represented the liberal element of the party, and that was the only element which would survive. Under those circumstances, Governor, how can you be neutral if those two men are running in Oregon? Mr. Bell, first of all, I'd like to go back to the original quotation which you have read, and that was made not so much in the idea of getting... Mr. Nixon off the ticket, as I felt so much the need of Mr. Nixon becoming an ambassador at large for the United States. I had felt also in having a long friendship with Mr. Paul Hoffman that he did represent a point of view that would be uh, very well placed on our ticket. I, in the meantime, have felt that Governor or that Mr. Nixon has certainly earned the reputation for being a moderate. Uh, because he has adopted many liberal points of view as well as conservative. But I would not like to get into an argument of what is a liberal and what is a conservative because I think it depends upon the issue. I do classify myself as a moderate Republican tending toward the liberal because of certain specific issues upon which I have taken a stand. Well, Governor, you don't see any difference then in Rockefeller and Nixon as far as the liberal viewpoint is concerned. I believe that it's a little bit early to tell exactly what Governor Rockefeller's uh, political philosophy is, uh, more than just what he campaigned upon. I would like to see uh, his performance in office, because sometimes I feel that the performance in office more eloquently tells the philosophy of a man than his speeches oftentimes may do. I feel that Governor Rockefeller certainly does represent the liberal point of view. Well, don't you think his performance in the office has been uh, as a liberal, or do you question that? No, I don't question it, but I don't think that everything that he has done in office would uh, put him exclusively in the category of being a liberal. I'm not familiar enough with all of his performance to be able to evaluate it, but I would say that he certainly does have the reputation for being a liberal, and I think that's good. Mr. Murray. Governor Hatfield, let's try to get at it this way. Do you consider your own position uh, closer to that of Mr. Rockefeller or Mr. Nixon? I would say that my position would depend upon the issue that we are considering. Uh, if it's a matter of providing housing for those who cannot provide housing for themselves or through private activity, then I would be, say, a liberal for supporting a government housing program. If it's a matter of civil rights, I take my position as being a very strong advocate of civil rights. So I suppose that would be called a liberal position. Well, let's look at it from the position of the uh, vice presidential spot on the ticket. You're on record, I think, as uh, saying that you would accept or seriously consider an offer to run 
as vice president. Now, uh, since you and Mr. Nixon come from the same part of the country, uh, would you say that uh, uh, this still leaves you neutral between uh, Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Nixon? Well, I think the neutrality has to be explained a little bit further because the Oregon preference primary is very unique. I have established my position of neutrality because I have felt that the need exists that following the battle which no doubt will take place in the Oregon primary, we need someone to bring together again the party to have a united front to meet the Democratic opponent in the general election. So my neutrality is not so much that I feel that I cannot identify myself with either one of these men and their political philosophy as much as it is to have a united party after the primary. Mr. Henry. Governor, do you think that it's a good thing to have a fight in the primary between Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Nixon? I think it is very healthy. As a Republican, I think we have taken our position very clearly as being uh, most uh, definitely in favor of the free enterprise system, which has as its essence competition. I think if we're to be consistent in our political as we are within our economic philosophy, we ought to believe and encourage competition. I don't think that uh, the state of California, with its Republican experience of musical chairs, is a good example of what should be done, but rather if they would have had, as I feel all parties should have, outright competition. It leaves to then the voter, the rank-and-file member, the right of choosing his candidate, rather than having his candidate chosen by a smoked fill room or political manipulators at a national convention. Governor, you were a leader, I believe, in getting the name of General Eisenhower on the primary list in Oregon some years ago. You then will insist on getting both Nixon and Rockefeller on the, in the primary in Oregon? Mr. Henry, I believe that our law, as I referred to before, is such that it will automatically bring both of those names together on the primary ballot. Mr. Hill. Well, Governor Hatfield, as I understand it, in your state, a person's name can go on that primary ballot against his will, even if a petition is filed with 1,000 signatures. Now, why should 1,000 citizens of Oregon be able to dictate something that may conflict with the national strategy of a presidential aspirant? I think that is in keeping with the basic objective uh, that I, along with the others who authored this bill, which then became law, had in mind. And that is, we were hoping to begin an experiment that would lead toward a national preferential primary to choose the presidential candidates rather than leaving it to the convention to operate and manipulate. I feel the rank and file member of the party it should belong to him. That is the right to choose his candidate. I believe that once a man enters a political profession, he becomes public property in a sense, that he should not be permitted to just pick and choose which primary he desires to enter. He should be willing to let his name be entered in any primary and face all opponents, come one, come all, in a fair and equitable way. Mr. Mr. Hill, continue. Have you, uh, uh, you know, if, if there is a lot of uh, sentiment in other quarters in the country uh, for this idea of a national preferential primary, I'm wondering what the chances are of maybe getting something done about it. I don't know, but in 1948, I believe the state of Nebraska had an experiment here where they had listed all the names, and they had about a 300% increase in voter turnout to that primary because there was this keen interest exhibited on the part of the voter. I feel that Oregon in 1960 will provide certainly a, uh, what you might call, an experiment ground upon which we could judge the next move, which would be toward the national primary. Governor, uh, you know the grassroots of your state probably better than almost anybody else. If the primary were held today, uh, who do you think would win, Rockefeller or Nixon? I think the vice president, Mr. Nixon, would win the Oregon primary as of today. Do you think that that necessarily need be true uh, by the time the primaries come around? No, because I don't believe there's anything stagnant about a political scene, and certainly uh, not at this time especially. Uh, the 1960 primary is still a number of months off. And so I think that with the events that can take place between now and then, it could reverse the field, and Mr. Rockefeller could possibly carry Oregon. I only refer back to 1948 when Mr. Dewey entered Oregon 
at a time when it was generally conceded it was about two to one for Stassen against Mr. Dewey. And in a whirlwind tour, he captured Oregon because the people in our state are willing to listen and be objective to any candidate who wishes to present himself. Mr. Bell. Governor, don't you think your party is a little bit stagnant? You say that uh, there's nothing stagnant in the political situation. In 1958, you lost 13 senators, 46 congressmen, five governors. What's the matter with the Republican Party? I think that was an accumulative effect of conditions and circumstances that had been in our party and outside of our party for a number of years. I feel that in my traveling uh, to the states of Michigan and California and Hawaii, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and talking to Republican leaders and to Republicans, that we have a revival of Republican spirit, a revival of Republican idealism. I believe that our party is going to become a majority party if, if our party will adhere to a dynamic idealism and to present itself in the proper light with proper articulation. I think the image of the Republican Party has not been good, but I believe that there is a, a revival of a good image which has traditionally been ours in our heritage. Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray. Uh, Mr. Murray. Uh, as one of the young Republican leaders, what do you think the campaign issues for 1960 should be for the Republicans? I think the campaign issues should certainly definitely be foreign policy as it relates to keeping of the peace. I think it ought to relate to all of the many facets of the domestic scene as it relates to prosperity of housing, civil rights, education, all of these factors which will make for a better life. I believe that those are the issues upon which the Republican Party must take a position by its record of accomplishment and by an idealism which it can expound. Mr. Henry. Governor, uh, because the presidency is an executive and administrative job, a good many people feel that previous experience in the State House is a good thing. Do you feel that's a good idea? I think it depends on the individual. I would not make any blanket uh, statement as to all people coming under the same qualification. I think Mr. Wilkie, who had not had any previous political gubernatorial or senatorial or other type of political experience, would have made an excellent president. I think uh, Mr. Nixon, with his outstanding experience in the Senate and in the vice presidency, would be an outstanding president. And Mr. Rockefeller could certainly go from the governorship of New York, which is the largest state, to an outstanding presidential term. Mr. Hill. Governor, the Republicans obviously would rather not have the United States' slowness in the space race become a major campaign issue next year. Uh, how do you think they can keep it out as an issue? Well, I do not claim to be an authority in this field. I would probably say that uh, in answer to your question, uh, I would have to become better educated on that subject before I could make an intelligent comment. Mr. Bell. Governor, won't you Republicans just campaign for peace? Pardon me? Won't you Republicans just campaign for peace and pass over these other things like that? Well, when you say you Republicans, I, don't, I can't speak for all of the Republicans, but uh, if I have any role in the national campaign as a governor campaigning for the ticket, I will certainly not restrict my campaign statements or speeches to the peace issue. That's the important one. But I think there are many others that are as important to the welfare of our people. Mr. Henry, short one. Yes, Governor, what? Are... Well, I'm afraid it would require a longer answer. I was going to ask, what are the really basic differences between the Republican and Democratic Party? I think the basic issue is that the Republican Party believes in keeping the government closer to the people. I think we believe that if there's a problem, then we ought to try to solve it at the local level before we go to the federal uh, level to find the answer. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have reached the halfway mark. It's time for Governor Edmondson. Governor Edmondson is the nation's youngest governor and the youngest in the history of Oklahoma. He too won a victory in 58 that everyone thought impossible. After graduating from law school, he went into private practice. In 1954, he was elected Tulsa County Attorney and was re-elected in 1956. He has recently highlighted his interest in national democratic affairs 
by inviting all potential Democratic presidential candidates to come to Oklahoma City on November 14th to speak at the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner. The subject, new ideas for the Democratic Party in 1960. Now, Governor Edmondson, we'll start the questions again with Mr. Bell. Governor, you've been talking quite a bit about new ideas for the Democratic Party, and you've invited all these presidential candidates there. Do you have any new ideas yourself that the Democrats could use? Well, I can say this, that uh, Jack, being uh, in a state office rather than in a national picture, that the new ideas that I have are more particularly applicable to the state, naturally, because I've sought new ideas for Oklahoma to perform my duties, my responsibility to the state. Uh, therefore, I'm not considering myself an expert on the national issues. I wouldn't profess to be able to offer these new ideas. The reason for inviting all of the major potential candidates on the Democratic ticket to Oklahoma to discuss them is so that Oklahomans can hear what their ideas are. Well, Governor, is it just new ideas you want, or do you want new faces in the Democratic Party? Do you think the Democratic leadership has gone stale? You mean the Democratic leadership in Congress? In Congress, in the National Committee, generally speaking? No, I don't think that uh, the Democratic Party leadership in Congress or Paul Butler, either one, have gone stale. Well, they don't seem to agree with each other. Which side are you on? Are you on Lyndon Johnson's side or Paul Butler's side? Well, as to, it would have to depend upon, Jack, what particular question you're talking well, about. Well, general philosophy. Well, one sir. is middle of the road, the other is extremely liberal. Now, where would you be in? Well, if, you were, if you were to take uh, an issue, I might know better how to answer the question. On the issue of, of uh, civil rights, I think that uh, Mr. Butler's position is the correct position uh, insofar as what the Democratic Party should do on that question. However, I would criticize his attitude in that he has, in my opinion, unnecessarily crowded those elements of the Democratic Party who don't stand exactly in the same position with him. Governor, on that Mr. issue, Mr. Murray, do you, do you uh, have a, a solution yourself for the widespread split in uh, the party on civil rights between the North and the South? Well, if I did, I would probably uh, claim uh, to be a candidate myself for one of those top well, two let's spots. Let's try it another way. Do you think that the that the Democratic Party in Los Angeles next summer will be able to write a civil rights civil rights plank that will avoid a Dixiecrat walkout? I do not think that there will be a walkout. Uh, by the same token, I think that the Democratic Party should take a straightforward approach to civil rights and be outspoken in it, uh, which might very well be uh, offensive to some uh, people in the South, some political leaders. But I don't think that they have any place to go but with the Democratic Party. Therefore, I don't think that they'll walk out even if the Democratic Party takes that position. Mr. Henry. <clears throat> uh, Governor, you're reported to have been quite critical at times of uh, Vice President Nixon's campaigning procedure. Do you believe that if he should be the Republican nominee that we'd have a bitter personalized campaign? No, I don't think it's a question of uh, Mr. Nixon's uh, shall we say, his character. I certainly wouldn't uh, pretend to say that he is dishonest or anything but honest. But I think uh, he demonstrated in his campaign for the United States Senate in California against uh, Helen Gahagan Douglas an inclination, or maybe I should say a willingness, to use tactics that uh, are not high enough from the standpoint of the level of political tactics to qualify him for the position of the presidency of the United States. Mr. Hill. Uh, Governor, do you think uh, Mr. Nixon or Mr. Rockefeller would be the easier man for the Democrats to beat next year? Well, I can't help but make this observation. Uh, as a young or new Democrat, or at least in the field, 
I would probably be inclined to take the advice of some of those who have been in it longer and say, well, aren't we supposed to say that Vice President Nixon will be the harder to defeat? Uh, That's what I think the tactic of the Democratic Party is now, or some of the Democrats. But I would be frank to say that personally, I believe that Governor Rockefeller would be the most difficult to beat. Why? I think that uh, when I'm speaking about more particularly Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a democratic state, and I think that Governor Rockefeller is more democratic with the capital D than uh, Vice President Nixon is. Governor, uh, Mr. Eisenhower carried Oklahoma. Are you saying then that you think that Mr. Rockefeller could carry Oklahoma, but that Mr. Nixon couldn't? I think that... uh, uh, Rockefeller would have a better chance of carrying Oklahoma than uh, Nixon would. Well, that's not uh, exactly the answer I I wanted, Governor. What was the answer that you wanted? <laughs> well, I wanted a specific answer on that. Do you think Mr. Rockefeller could carry Oklahoma? Uh, I think that depends on who uh, the Democrats nominate. I don't. I'm not of that school of thought that uh, it doesn't make any difference who we nominate in the Democratic Party. He'll win think that we have to nominate a good man, and that a good man can, with a good platform, can defeat either uh, Governor Rockefeller or Vice President Nixon. Mr. Bell. All right, Governor, who's a good man? Well, I think think that uh, uh, Jack Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, is uh, a good man. That's Uh, one. All right. I think that Senator Symington is a good man. I think Lyndon Johnson Three. is a good man. You name them. Are you naming them in order of preference? No, or? no. I think I can say this about Oklahoma without any hesitation, Jack. That uh, right now, I believe personally that Senator Kennedy is the most popular in Oklahoma, and I think that that's true throughout the United States. But. What position of popularity he'll be in next July, I don't know. Is he most popular with you personally? Well, he is very popular with me. I think he's a fine More person so than and a the personal others, friend. I, mean. I know him better. You lean toward Kennedy, in other words. No, I can't say that I lean toward him because I don't have control over the Democratic delegation in Oklahoma, but I know him a lot better than I do uh, the other candidates, therefore... He's more popular with me in that sense. Mr. Murray. Governor, since the space <clears throat> victories by the Russians, uh, the U.S. has been charged with having lost its sense of national purpose. Do you think we have? You mean the space loss in the sense that we've fallen behind the uh, Russians in that I battle? I think there's a general criticism of, of the country having lost its sense of national purpose as a result of this uh, defeat. In well, space. Well, I think that we have slipped, and I think it's been quite disappointing to Americans and disheartening to Americans insofar as national purpose uh, goes along that line. Mr. Henry. Governor, I want to get back to the candidates. Uh, do you feel that uh, Lyndon Johnson's chances for the nomination have been injured by the severe criticism by the ADA of the congressional actions of this last session? Well, the ADA certainly represents uh, a very definite wing of the Democratic Party and a substantial wing of it. Therefore, any criticism or opposition that a large organization like that would take against any candidate would be detrimental to him. Mr. Hill. Uh, Getting back to space, uh, do you think the Democrats can make that a prime issue of this campaign? Can, will be able to? I think that peace is going to be, uh, whether pronounced by the Democrats or the Republicans, one of the principal issues. And its preservation for the next four years, as well as the fact that it has been preserved in the past. Uh, Therefore, I think that the Democrats can make an issue out of that particular point. How well it may be preserved uh, may depend on how well we can shoot rockets. That's exactly right. Well, Governor, if we are at peace by the time of the election, uh, what chance has the Democratic Party to win on an issue of peace since the Republicans have been in power while we were at peace? Well, I think that that will be the Republican argument to it, Mr. Spivak, of course, but 
uh, Americans are going to be concerned not only about whether or not we have been at peace for the past eight years, or, but also, even more particularly, whether we will be at peace for the eight years or four years uh, following. Mr. Bell. Governor, I ought to go back to something you said a moment ago, that you don't control the Oklahoma delegation to the convention. Who is going to control it then? Well, I don't mean to imply by that that I won't attempt to have an influence over it. But uh, before Oklahoma is committed to any candidate, we have to go through the usual convention procedures of precinct, county, district, and state conventions. Are you going to let somebody take that delegation away from you? Well, I'm not going to if I can possibly help it, Jack. Mr. Henry. Governor, do you think that it was a good idea for the president to agree to the exchange of visits with Mr. Khrushchev? I'm really not qualified to say whether uh, it was a wise decision or not. Personally, I have no criticism to make of it. Mr. Murray. Well, Governor, something has uh, pushed Mr. Nixon and Mr. Rockefeller to the top of the public opinion polls over any Democrat. What do you think that's been? Well, I think that in, uh, Nixon's popularity uh, recently has come about from the demonstration uh, in Russia between himself and uh, Premier Khrushchev. And the people think the exchange is a pretty good thing. I think so. I, I believe that they have gained a lot of confidence that they didn't have before that in the vice president. Very short one, Mr. Hill. <laughs> uh, in the uh, recent uh, Democratic Midwestern State Conference, there was a split. And the Oklahoma delegates went with both liberal and conservative factions. Is the whole state of Oklahoma divided that way? No, I don't think it is at all, Mr. Hill. I think that that was sort of a side issue there in Kansas City. I'm sorry to interrupt, but our time is up. And monitors thanks to Governor J. Howard Edmondson of Oklahoma 